Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Back in the 1960s, when I first read that char populations left over from the end of the last glacial period were still to be found at a number of deep water locations in Northern England and Scotland, they were still, at that time, officially recognised as being 140 separate subspecies, with site-specific extensions to the scientific names. That, obviously, has changed, with just the single species, Salvolinus alpinus, now recognised, though char experts reckon they can actually see and identify physical differences between some populations, presumably brought about by several thousand years of geographical isolation. Not all populations reproduce at the same time either, most preferring to spawn in the autumn. In Coniston, however, most are said to favour the spring, whereas nearby Windermere has both spring and autumn spawning populations. But it's Coniston, which when I caught my first char was a part of Lancashire, that we're going to concentrate on here. And to help us understand these supposedly enigmatic, but often quite prolific and easily caught fish, I'm in the company of plumb-line char trolling experts Jeff Carroll and Bill Gibson from Coniston Village. This technique is often referred to as commercial char fishing because Coniston, like nearby Windermere, has a long history of people rowing traditional style boats out over deep water with long trolling poles, heavy leads and strings of carefully handcrafted lures to catch char, though these days it tends to be done mainly as a hobby and to keep the old traditions alive. To contrast this, I've spent many years catching char on single spinners using the conventional way, also on bait and even a couple on the fly. Between us then, Jeff, Bill and myself should be able to give the whole subject of char fishing quite an extensive looking at. Perhaps you should both introduce yourselves for purposes of voice recognition. Jeff Carroll. Bill Gibson. Right then, to kick things off. Could you both explain your interest in char fishing and how you came to get involved? It set off with me. I was fishing off the side for perch when I was a youngster. And most youngsters start fishing for perch. And you'd see the chaps going out on the lake with these boats with the big bamboo canes hanging over the side. I thought, I just fancy doing that. And uh, I got acquainted with an old char fisherman who had actually given over char fishing through ill health. But... Uh, he fired me interest in it and uh, showed me how to make baits and that, and that's where it, it started for me, really. And for me, really, it was just the starting fishing thing and, you know, the excitement of actually catching a fish. I think the first fish I actually caught was a half-pound trout with my dad. And, you know, the adrenaline just really goes. And that, that first year, I think I caught two trout and three char, and it was like, that was like a bucket load. But now it's it's like nothing compared to what you can catch, in a, even in a day, really, I suppose. For those who are not familiar with the char fishing scene, it might be a good idea first then to outline the trolling techniques and equipment used. I mentioned earlier the traditional Lake District rowing boat, so perhaps you should describe that before moving on to the actual fishing gear used. Well, normally the boats traditionally were sort of like 16, 18 foot long clinker built uh, lake boats with a, a reasonable keel so that when they were going across the lake in, in a bit of a chop, they wouldn't crab too much, but nowadays a lot of people have moved away from uh, from using clinker build boats and moved towards fiber glass just from a, a maintenance point of view really they're much easier to maintain you don't have to put them on the lake and sweat and swell up and, and this kind of thing and just they're much cheaper to maintain and a bit more robust and don't suffer from rock quite the same and what are your thoughts exactly the same we used to use a wooden rowing boat for years when we first started fishing Trouble is, if, if you break a rib in the boat or you've got a, a plant that needs repairing, you've either got to be handy yourself or know someone who can do it. And you, it's, it's inconvenient if you, if you go down to the lake and someone's put a hole in your boat. And so it puts you out of action. So, you know, eventually we have gone on to the fiberglass, the modern fiberglass when boat. We, when we first started, they had a, a clinker built boat, but my dad ran the boating centre and he was basically a semi trained boat builder. And if there was any planks or patches or ribs needed doing, then we knew a bloke who could. But, you know, we don't now. He's not here anymore. So, he's, uh, you know, you, you, you work with what you can work with, really. Do you not feel, though, that fishing from a fiberglass boat takes something of the traditional magic out of the thing? It's interesting you should say that, because uh, quite a few times I've come off the lake, pulled the boat onto the trailer, and 
people have commented how nice a boat it looks and how they like one and I've actually had people taking photographs of it so it's just the shape of that boat is a nice it's a nice shape the boat we use at the moment other boats maybe might not look quite as as good but it's, it's got some nice woodwork on on the yeah. on the top and it's uh, it's, it's, it's tastefully not, done yeah it's not out of place <laughs> I don't think on that lake do you not find that some of the newer style boats and materials perform less well in a chop because it can get quite nasty out on Coniston or maybe you find them better they sat lower in the water the wooden ones and you yeah. tended if you if you were out on the lake and the wind picked up you'd have waves coming over over the front yeah, end yeah. You, Jeff? But, but the other thing is though that the most of the fiberglass boats that we the other people use and and the one we use the mold is taken off the clinker boat so it's yes it's it's fiberglass and it sits a bit higher in the water and it's ever so slightly different but the actual shape of it it's based on a clinker built boat and it's it's very subtle it's just an updated version Otherwise, we'd all still be driving Model T's, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Worth a few bob, then. Yeah, it would, yeah. I hired one of the traditional wooden boats one day on Crummock Water to fish for char and ferox, and it started cutting up a bit choppy that day. And I have to say that I didn't feel entirely at ease. The only good thing is, though, that at least wood floats. Cling to the wood. Long glacial ribbon lakes with the surrounding fells are notorious for channeling the wind. I've both seen and been out in some horrendous conditions over the years. We even hauled three blokes out in a snowstorm one day after their boat had been swamped running for cover beam onto the waves. Have either of you two had any similar close calls? I can remember one first of May we set off fishing, like the fishing, the char fishing season changed from the 15th of March to the 1st of May and you're always look forward to the 1st of May and it was really, really windy and we probably shouldn't have set off but we did and we got so far down the lake we couldn't get turned round and we actually had to beach the boat about a mile and a half down the lake and walk back and get a trailer and take it back to pick the boat up off the side. But that's the only time we really sort of needed rescuing, really, I think. Um, yeah, and that was self-rescue. I mean, there's, there's, there's other times. I mean, the thing is, if, if it's rough when you set off, if it's too rough to go out, then you don't go out. It's different if it cuts up rough when you're out there. But generally... You know, we're long enough in the tooth to know what we're doing, really. And, OK, it doesn't, doesn't preclude accidents, but we do know what we're doing and we know pretty much what we're comfortable with. Mm. You know your limits out there, don't yeah. you? I mean, just slightly off-piste is that we've, we've fished on Loch Melvin in Ireland and there's only one way to describe that and that was bloody awful <laughs> it was I mean that was life jacket time mm. wasn't it we were under a bit of pressure to catch a child yeah we were we foolishly went out and we shouldn't have gone out really and it was oh, it was absolutely desperate mm. <laughs> that was rough yeah I've heard about some of those big Irish lots and the trout men over there using the live mayflies anyway moving on the fishing gear as well as the technique is also pretty special and presumably adapted specifically for working in deep lakes. Traditionally, the rods are uh, bamboo, usually either Java cane or brown Burma, and they were sourced from a firm called Jacobs Young and Westby Limited in Haywards Heath. You can't get them anymore there. Um, I don't know whether they were out of business, but you can't get this type of cane that sets off an inch in, at the bottom and tapers to a nice pencil thickness at the end. They're hard to source now, other canes. All the lines are modern lines now, the nylon, whereas years ago they'd have to treat the lines with lamp black and varnish, hang them out to dry, and that would make them rock proof and it would also make them easier to handle because it would uh, stiffen the line up basically, it wouldn't fly around in a breeze when you've got it in the boat. Gear is good now, gear doesn't rot, it's, it's easy, you know, the lines are easy to, to purchase now. And things, nowadays you can use things like ball bearing swivels. Whereas, you know, 100 years ago, they wouldn't have ball bearings with No, that's right. What about the length of these poles? They tend to vary. Um, if you get chaps fishing on their own, they'll probably use shorter rods. Because if you get a fish on one side of tackle and you bring that, that side of tackle into the boat, the other one tends to pull you around. And if you've got a longer rod, the more pull on the rod. So anybody usually fishes on their own, usually fishes short rods. But normally they're anywhere between 14 feet and 18 foot long. And how do you fix them into the boat to ensure they're held at right angles? 
the fixed with brackets and the brackets are adjustable uh, so you can alter the height of the rod up and down because you might you know until you've actually got that weight on it you don't know whether it's going to fish pull down into the water or it's going to be two foot above the water ideally I, I like to be fishing about 18 inches above the water that gives you good clearance even on a choppy day you, your rod should be clear of the water but the other thing is you don't you don't normally have them at right angles to the boat you normally have them just feathered back slightly so that the ideal thing or the, the traditional ideal thing was to have it so that the end of the pole was just about in line with the end of the boat the back of the boat stern so you know you have them slightly angled out and some of it depends on your rowing point as well because on the boat we have we have two rowing points and we always row from the the forward point rather than the midships so that we put the pole just slightly uh, after midships and then they're feathering back so that you can get a good angle on them because if you're rowing on your own or you know the guy who's rowing sometimes sees the bike before the guy who's sat doing the lines cup of coffee whatever but they often see you first and if it's at right angles, it's more difficult to see because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're creating your neck to see it. Whereas if it's feathered back slightly, it brings it more into your field of vision. And it also gives the chap in the back of the boat more room to work the lines as well. That's why, you, mm. you know, you're at the, the bow end of the boat rather than the stern really, you're not on the oars. That's another reason why you do that. Speaking of bite indication, there's also a bell that goes on the end of each pole. There is. <laughs> Traditionally, a Victorian horse bell. Again, they're really hard to get. You might saw some in an antique shop. I brought actually brought one with me to show you. When you get a char on, it'll do that. When you get a big trout on, it'll do that. <laughs> and if you get a salmon on, it'll probably take it under the water. You occasionally do hook up with yeah. bigger fish, you yeah. know. Pike take just generally tends to be like a a grab. Then it just the the whole pole just goes down where a large trout or a pike a huge, uh, large trout or a salmon should I say it's a violent take yeah. and it really is and a violent there's a lot of a vigorous mm. kind of you know there's a, an urgency to the shaking of the bell rather than with a pike which is kind of it'll give a ring and then it'll just drag down so it's possible then to some extent to identify what's grabbed hold of a lure by a combination of pole movement and bell noise yeah, yeah ish within reason <laughs> and it's also when you're catching char, you can sometimes tell whether the char is near the surface spinners or or, or the well down, you know, on the, on the bottom spinners, the bite. And sometimes you can just tell by the movement of the rod and the ring of the bell at what depth that fish has taken, taken the lure. The technique itself, actually, is a hybrid of hand lining and rod fishing in that while you have a long pole, you don't have a reel. So tell us how that particular combination works in conjunction with the other bits and pieces, such as the shackles and nails, to avoid any tangles. Well, really, the shackles tend to be made of high-gauge copper wire, and they're almost like a, an archaic version of a three-way swivel, really. And what you do is, when you're, you're hand-lining, you use them to, to give you, essentially, a dropper, and then you hook them over a shackle hook, when you're bringing the lines in, or when you're, you're first setting the lines, so it's it's all really based around the shackle and the depth between the shackles. Traditionally, they would probably run six baits, and now more commonly eight baits are used. It used to be sort of ten, twelve, thirteen feet between shackles, and now more commonly nines used. And the old-fashioned way of doing it was to have them running. So the, the, the baits were all the same distance away from the main line in terms of the bottom bait would be swimming much closer to the, to the plum. It would only be maybe three or four feet long. And the top dropper would be much, much longer. But typically now people just let them run along, you know, with 12 foot of, uh, sort of heavy duty line. Then you've got six foot of gut. It's connected with a ball bearing swivel, and then uh, and then you're into your gut, which is usually what ten pound nylon usually. Not because you're hoping to catch a big fish, but if you use two pound nylon, if it was windy, say it would blow your lines around in the boat. So you're trying to avoid a tangle really, rather than trying to catch something 
something bigger. And back to what Jeff was saying about traditionally all the spinners would be fished where they would be coming through the water all in a line together. The idea of that was that if you hit a shawl of char, all the spinners would be coming through the shawl of char at the same time. But the speed of the boat, by the time you started to bring that tackle in, the other spinners would be coming through the through the shoals anyway, no matter how, you know, if there were eight or ten feet difference, you know, they, they, they would be coming through, so, but traditionally, the lines were all set where they were in one long row, your spinners would be in one long, long row, and you, you'd be fishing your plumb line at around 45 degrees, would be the right speed to row that boat, depending on the weight of your plumb as well. And the shackles, presumably, and the spacing of those shackles, is to help prevent tangles when you're bringing all the lures in, say, for a move. Obviously, you have a tried and tested procedure, so what can you tell us about that? When you bring your lines and you've got a line attached to the boat called a lazy line, and that runs out to your plumb line. So you, your lazy line is attached to the side of the boat. If you get a bite, you get your lazy line, bring your lazy line in, and you bring your first shackle in, hang it on the nail on the gunnel, and the back line or dropper line, which is coming off your shackle, which your, your bait or lure is attached to, you bring that into the boat. Some char fishermen have little boxes in the boat. If they're fishing eight lures, they'll have eight little compartments, and each spinner as it's brought in the boat is dropped into its own compartment. Your last spinner to come in the boat is the first one to go out again. It's dead easy. If you haven't got compartments to pick the wrong one up, then that's that's how things can go badly wrong. Yeah, it's, dead, it's, it's one of these ones where it's dead easy to do it right and it's dead easy to do it wrong. Mm, <laughs> yeah. What's the truth in the story about the lures way back when being made out of silver or even gold? Or are these just old wives' tales? What can you tell us then about the history of char lures? I have had one or two lures with gold on them that have been given to me by older generation char fishermen sadly those lures out they'd been lost years ago either on the bottom or fish have taken them but uh, it is a fact that gold was used on lures and probably still is to a certain extent my own opinion is brass is as good a substitute for gold um, some silver is used now silver is a really good colour to catch char I know one of the top men on Windermere has silver on every bait that he has whether it's just a little blob of silver or the whole side of silver or two sides of silver sweated together. He swears by silver and um, it is a good colour to catch char on. I think in the olden days one of the reasons they maybe used gold if they could get it was because it didn't tend to tarnish the same. The old fashioned way of thinking was as soon as you put the fingerprint on the bait that was it, you know, you had to go and repolish it. And maybe we don't quite subscribe to that, maybe we're, because we're lazy or we've not got quite as much time, but there is an element to it, I mean, Billy spends hours polishing his baits, but, you know, he, the old-fashioned guys, you know, if they were coming home from after a day's quarrying, and they'd been out the night before, maybe they hadn't had a chance to polish the baits, so if they could get away with not polishing them because they were gold, or they had gold on them, you know, they maybe only had to do one side rather than the other. There's a, there's a lot of sort of habits involved in it, and, and there's a a little bit of sort of mystique about it and but they always said you know you've got to have a highly polished bait well to be fair at 60 or feet down in Coniston or Windermere or wherever you're fishing there's not an awful lot of light down there if any and so it's more the the sort of swim of it and the vibration of the bait that's going to cause the fish to go to it probably more than whether or not you've spent two and a half hours polishing it I think colour's quite important. Yeah. I know when the fishing was really good years ago, I'd been absolutely hammered by other boats who'd been fishing the right colour. You won't believe it, you know. You, I've, I've had it done to me and I've done it to other people where you're catching the fish and they aren't catching the fish. Both their boats are in front of you and you're following them, they aren't catching a thing and you're coming up behind them and you're catching fish after fish after fish. And I've had it done to me. I can remember two chaps from Windermere coming on to Coniston donkeys years ago just when we were really learning how to do it and uh, we were catching an odd one or two and I watched these boats, this boat come up the east side and it was just fish after fish and they weren't just pulling one or two, they were pulling three and four in at a time that was uh, Arthur Goodine mm. and Chris Newton and uh, 
it sort of puts things into perspective. You know, sometimes you think the fishing isn't very good, then you get a boat coming on, and it just shows you the potential of the fishing can be if you just get the right colour and get that colour at the right depth. Like fish on Conison, where after a while you'll get to pick up which baits are, you know, you've got a bit of confidence in and which baits haven't, and you'll try to fish those baits where you think the fish are going to be biting. You know, you move them up and down the tackle, you might be fishing your better baits on, on the eighth bait down and the seventh bait down, and, you know, move them about a bit. You know, if the fish are in, on mid water, fish them on the middle of the tackle, you know, that's it's. It's a, it's experimentation, isn't it? A lot of it, you know, just trying to get get them on the right colour and that. And that. You say colour, but do you mean that in the literal sense of an actual colour you can apply to the lure, or do you mean the colour of the burr metal used to form the spinner blade? No, the the metal, the colour of the metal, either bronze, brass, yellow bronze, silver, copper. You can have a bait that's catching fish. You can make a bait what you think is a perfect copy of it and it might not catch anything for you. It's strange, it is, that's why I enjoy it. Because no one's really fathomed it out yet and I don't think anyone ever will, you know. And some days you can go out and it's like low light and they'll be taking silver and other days you can go out and it's like bright and they'll take copper. And you think, well, is it to do with the amount of light that's able to penetrate? Is it to do with the way the individual baits vibrate and because there's different patterns, there's things like traditional, almost like macro spinner type pattern, there's things like swallowtails which are almost like a fish shape, there's, there's all kinds of different patterns and then there's different variations on it where people put things like strips on or even put holes in them so they vibrate differently and the, the message they give off is different and as Bill says, you know, nobody's really fathomed it but you kind of get to know what sort of works. You also mention patterns, but none of the sort you could go into a shop and buy. These, I take it, are all handmade with designs that date back absolute donkey's years. You wouldn't sort of go in and, and into a shop and, and buy one. It's funny, really, because when I'm rotten line fishing for char, the lighter the lure I use, the better. My favourite design is called a gen spin. And always, I use silver with some red in the form of either beads or wool. When I first set up making jar baits donkey's years ago, I used to paint the pins red. And some lads still do, but yeah. I don't bother doing that anymore. But, uh, In fact, when we first started, really, what we did was we, we had a... I just used to go out with rods and put a, a toby on the back. And just used to drag it through water, sort of like six or eight foot below the surface. And that was where we really started, I would mm. say. That's where we first just started Just paint 30 yards of line out behind the boat and just... Roll up the up the up the drop offs really yeah. on the sides there you know but I don't think that would work very well now because the fish aren't in that upper layer of water most no. of the time they're, they're too too deeper down there. Like. What about the lead or plumb down on the end of the line? Has as much thought been put into the shape and design of that as to the lures to ensure it does exactly what it's supposed to do? There's quite a lot of different types. Your traditional Windermere lead weight is a uh, ship. Well, you, that's, that's what it looks like, and all you can't see it on no. there. <laughs> it's a, sort of boot shaped. Some it's of kind, them are made. like a fin, isn't it? It, it is like a big thing. fin, yeah. I don't like those sort of patterns, but I brought that with me just to show you. But I favour the ones that um, I make about a copper pipe, fill them with lead, and they have a big fin on the back, and they seem to swim true through the water, where that, they all seem to wobble, these Windermere ones. And a, you can see a movement on the rod all the time, and it's a bit off putting. Sometimes you can't tell whether you've got a bite or it's just the plumb weight moving about, in, you know, down in the depths there. And what are we talking about here in terms of actual physical weight? Anywhere between a pound and a half and two pound. So, you're out on the lake heading for deep water. What exactly are you looking for there? And how do you go about setting the gear down to work when you arrive at the right spot? Previous fishing trips more or less tell you where the best marks are on the lake. There's areas to be avoided. Potentially anywhere can hold a char, but after fishing on the lake 30 odd years, you've got your favourite areas. Um, I like to fish on the drop offs myself, but sometimes when you're fishing from one side of the lake and you decide to go across them to the side, you all catch char right in the middle, you know. If you've been out the day before and you, you've got half a dozen char somewhere in a certain location, general rule of thumb is go back to that location first the next day when you go out. 
where the fishing is at the moment, no two days tend to be the same. So you might get fishing in an area one day and you go back the following day and the fish probably aren't there where that would have worked years ago, Jeff, mm. wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you mean, know, you, you would you would always say this point or that point or the other point would be a good place to go. And I suppose when if you've not been out for a, a week or two, they would be your starting points. But if you don't do any good there, then you'll move on to the next one. And of course, you got the, the good thing is about this this kind of method because you keep constantly moving. There's always the potential to catch a fish up on your way to another mark because you don't just sort of up sticks and go to the next place. You you leave the gear in because there's always a chance of a trout or or whatever. But you know you're fishing and you know whatever grabs hold of your line you're fishing for really to, to some extent. But in terms of what you're looking for. When you know the lake, like Bill and I know, Coniston, you're not necessarily looking for anything sort of topography-wise, but when you go to other places, like we fished on Ennerdale, and you can get some real bum steers off off the topography around you, you know, you you think, oh, God, it's got to be really deep off there. So you, luckily we had a, a sounder with us, and instead of being where we thought it was going to be like 120 foot, it was like... 24. <laughs> 24. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, you think, oh, <laughs> thank God for technology at that point. But, I mean, on on here, we, we tend not to use uh, sounders anymore because we kind of know where we're going. People go on about fish finders, and, yeah, it's fine finding fish, but it doesn't put them on the hook for you. If we were going to use a sounder now, it'd be, it'd be really only if we'd gone to a water we weren't familiar with and for depth, because... You don't want to lose your gear, really. You know that that's, that would be really the yeah, only reason. Yeah, yeah. And if fish actually come across the screen, it makes it a little bit more interesting. Yeah. But that's not our aim to use a sounder to catch fish. It's just for depth purposes. Yeah. We've fished in locks in Scotland, where it's gone off the screen with the yeah. depth on it. You know, it's yeah. unbelievable what it can tell you. You know, it's you get, you it's get a lot of guesswork, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you get the odd fish putting a cameo appearance across the screen. <laughs> yeah. We're never going to catch anything here, and then the bell goes. You know, you think, well. Maybe there is something. Have you got any sort of depth range you prefer to be working in? Don't want to go any shallower than this, or don't want to go any deeper than that? And are you following the contours when you're fishing? I wouldn't like to fish in less than 80 feet deep, because I know my gear fishes at around 55, 60 foot, and if it did happen to come quickly, you could get caught out. You do catch the bottom... Most of the time it's a muddy bottom, you'll see the rod dip a bit and you'll speed up and you'll you'll get out, but the, there is spots on the lake, the, the best spot on the lake for catching char is ironically the best place for losing char fish and tackling yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's like a big reef underwater, that's all I can picture in my head. And there's always fish on that mark, even if you're not catching them, you know they're there. I took a couple of chaps out about six or seven weeks ago from down south fishing. And I'd been out the previous day, caught five or six char in a certain spot, went there, they weren't they weren't there, and we rode around for two or three hours, getting an occasional bite, and I was really struggling. I was and I was trying my hardest because they'd come a long way. They weren't bothered about catching fish, but I wanted to to put a char in the boat for them. And I said to them, I'll take you back up to the lake the lake now, I'll take you to a spot where if someone said, If you don't catch a char by midnight, I'm gonna shoot you. This is where I would go to. And I did manage to winkle a couple of char out and they were really set up about it. But, uh, it's, again, it's, it's, there's always char there, but you've just got to be so careful. It's a fine line between losing gear and not losing gear. It could be the difference between, if you're waiting 10 feet nearer the shore, you get fast up. And when you get fast up there, you get properly fast up, mm. don't you, Jeff? You know yourself. With the rod and line fishing, we probably have more of a margin for error and less to lose as a result because we're only fishing the one lure. But I've always found that when I'm over around 60 feet of water that the fish are between 20 and 40 feet down according to what's showing on the echo sounder. And because I know that at the speed we're moving at, one ounce of lead should take my lightweight spinner down 15 feet, I can then add lead accordingly. The other thing is that we mainly tend to catch our fish in the deeper part of the lake that's quite close into the shore. We rarely, if ever, find them out over open water. Yeah, what? you're fishing one depth, we're fishing eight. What about your trolling speed? You try and make it so that the line is roughly at 45 degrees. I mean, they always used to reckon that was 
about walking pace, which is about three miles an hour. The thing is, sometimes it's just not feasible. Like if you're going with the wind, you know, you're hard, then it's a rough day, you're hard pushed to keep it at that, you know, and you get, end up with the lines going a bit far back. It can cause problems, like if you end up with the two baits coming together because they're swimming too close. But generally, you're looking at that kind of pace. It can be a tall order to keep that kind of pace against the wind and all. Because if it's just a boat that you're pulling with your mate in, that's different. But when you've got two lots of two pound of lead swimming at 80 foot, it's a hell of a lot of drag. You, you know, you're half pushed, and by the time you've done your like half hour stint, you know, you're ready for a break. <laughs> These days, I always troll on the outboard motor. If it's too windy, we'll put yeah. the outboard on, and so it's, sometimes it's surprising. You'll maybe not have any bites, you'll turn the outboard on, mm. and you'll start catching fish. And I'm thinking, well, I'm, we're assuming it's vibration going through the boat, through the rods, down through the lines, and the fish are picking up on, on the lateral line, on the, on the body line. It's either that, or it's just to do with the constant speed, because if you think, if you're rowing against the wind, it's pull, pause, pull, pause, and you, you just, you don't know whether they don't like that. They can't tell you. Now, char, as we know, are capable of feeding at a whole range of levels and depths. I suppose to a large degree, this is controlled by seasonality, and in particular by the formation of a thermocline dividing the upper and lower levels over depth. So what's the pattern here as you see it? It's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a guessing game, really, because a thermocline probably builds on Connish in early April, mid-April, and then... It's, it can change so much. I mean, one thing we have noticed is generally the fish tend to migrate vertically. They tend to be higher in the water in the morning than they are in later on in the day. But then you've also got difference of days, you know, and, and they can be feeding higher up. A lot of it depends probably on plankton, on so many other factors. And, then, and sometimes you go out and you think, you know, it's not the day for them being high up. You get, you know, like a really warm, still day, you'd expect them to be right down, and then you catch them right on the surface, and you think, well, what are you doing here? And what about seasonal patterns? Do Char follow these over the year? They used to, there's no doubt about it. There was a pattern years ago. You go out on the 1st of May, and the fishing will be really good right through to probably the first week in June. And then you would think there was no char in that lake for about six weeks. Mm. You know, you were just a total waste of time going out. You might go out for five or six hours and just get one rattle and that would be your morning's fishing. And then about second or third week in July, you start catching them again and they would come back as a fatter fish. They must have been feeding on something down there and they were fat as pigs. And right through July, August, September, you'd catch fish probably right through to the end of the season. Not as many as what you would catch in the springtime, but a better quality of fish, there's no doubt about that. I think, but it's all changed, hasn't it? Definitely. I mean, over the last probably 20 years, you know, you don't, you almost don't bother fishing until middle of June because the fish aren't there. And there's various theories, and I have a theory that on Coniston you've got the predominance of uh, spring spawning char with a small, a relatively small autumn spawning uh, subspecies. And I think that the, due to the, the lack of snow melt and stuff that we probably had traditional winters, I think they're losing the trigger to spawn. I think we've almost in the dying out of a race of char, and the char that we're catching now are mainly autumn spawners. That's a very good point. But I'd heard that the Coniston char population has been waning for quite a few years now. What have been your observations there? Well, yeah, years ago we could go out on the 1st of May and you could almost guarantee, as long as the weather was all right and you didn't have to sort of beach the boat, you could probably catch a minimum of like a couple of dozen fish. You could almost, you know, you could sort of stake your pension on it. But now things have altered the days of catching a couple of dozen fish or more seem to have gone. But the, but those fish that we were catching were six ounces. You know, you, you think you've got a real... the pound, weren't Yeah, yeah, you think you've got a real 
a real good fish at like half a pound. But now we're catching fish that are three quarters, 15 ounces, pound two, that kind of good, really good solid fish. And the numbers are definitely down. Now whether it's the same kind of biomass, you know, the same weight of fish in there, but just spread among fewer fish, it's difficult because, you know, the FBA have been out and done all kinds of hydroacoustic surveys and it turned around and said there's hardly a fish in there and yet, you know, apparently there is. And it's it's very, very difficult because it's like almost like hunting for Nessie, I suppose, in a way, because the fish are never where you want to be in, in if, you, if you're trying to survey them. If you're trying to catch them, some days they're there, some days they aren't. I mean, if we went out now and caught a dozen fish, we'd think we'd had a real deal, wouldn't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you'd have probably ten pound of fish in the bucket if you had a dozen fish, and they'd be really quality fish. Now, I'm not convinced that the char are coming up to the, the depth of what we're fishing, and you find with char fishing, if you put extensions on the gear and send it further down into the depths, it doesn't seem to work, does it, Jeff? It just doesn't no. work somehow. I don't know why. Sixty foot, seventy foot seems the maximum what a char is willing to take a lure for some reason. You, well, you wonder whether it's light penetration at that point, because, yes, they know there's something there, but can they feasibly, you know, see what it is they're going to strike at? I mean, I've even spoken to the guys who did the Bluebird project, and they went down to 140 feet with um, sort of remote, remote submarines, as it were, with lights on, and they photographed char round the... Fuse larger bluebird, and they're resting on the bottom. They're not necessarily feeding, although at some point, they're dormant, mostly, yeah. but they're almost dormant. And you say, Well, what stimulates them to come off the bottom? What's the prompt to go down there? I, I don't know what that is. I can remember a few years ago, I thought the char fishing on Connors was dead and buried. I think I only got four fish all season. I thought, That is it, we're never going to see the like of it again. Yet the following season, I went out and I think I got 153, which isn't a lot of char really, but obviously those char, that 153 char, they were in the lake the year before, they hadn't just magically appeared from somewhere, so a lot of it, it's just whether they're in the mood or not, you know, just because you're not catching them doesn't mean to say they're not there, as I said before years ago, between say the middle of June and the middle of July, you were nearly wasting your mm. time, weren't you, Jeff? Yeah. Even though there was tens of thousands of char in there, they were just not interested in biting at all. And, you know, some people have turned around and said, oh, you know, you fished it out, you fished it out, you know, you used to take maybe sort of 30, 40 fish, you fished it out. Well, actually, the fishing pressure on a lake like Coniston for char is very, very minimal. Because even at the height of the fishing that we could remember, there was, what, maximum 15, 20 people actively char fishing. And there wouldn't be 15 or 20 people out at the same time. There'd be maybe half a dozen. Mm. And all and those char we caught, they'd all spawned, hadn't they? Yeah, they'd, yeah. They'd, done, they'd spawn in the lake, the next generation of char were coming on. So, and... The fishing was good for decades. You talk to these old lads, they'd, they'd tell you, you know, there's days where they were they were catching 100, 150 char. It wasn't an odd year, it was year on year. I can remember the old, the old lad who actually got me interested. They started doing catch returns for the northwest water that was then. And they were doing catch, some of, some of them were 1,500 char in a season off one boat. And that was back in the 50s and 60s. It was just a prolific fishery, and I, I don't really know what's gone wrong with it. The well, there's, there's, there's two things, in, in, in my opinion. One is, there's no doubt that as seasons have changed, and the climate's changed, I mean, it's not to do with weather, it's to do with climate. I've seen some data off the lake, and the firmer client seems to build at roughly the same time, like within a couple of days, over three or four years. It's like within a couple of days. But... It's also to do with the temperature of the lake. The thermocline can build at the same time, but it's how warm does that lake get. And then on top of that, you've also got man's influence in terms of nutrient enrichment. And 
mobility. I, I have fought long and hard to try and get something done about it. And we finally managed to get somewhere, probably just around about 2002, something like that, where we actually managed to get United Utilities and the Environment Agency both on board and they did a bit of a survey and they went, oh, well, best part, 50% of the phosphate budget that goes into Coniston comes from Coniston Sewage Works. Right, well, can we do something about that? And it's been round and round the houses, but thankfully last year they actually put a phosphate stripper on Coniston Sewage Works. And the difference that makes in terms of the outflow, previously you were looking at figures at the height of the season because Coniston has, has got like about 850 people live there, actually in the village. But heavy tourist time is probably about four and a half thousand. By the time you've got the campsites, the hotels, the B and Bs, and everything else full, there's a hell of a lot of people, and it all goes out of one hole into the lake. And you're looking at a difference between if you said the top thing was about a hundred and twenty, and when they put the phosphate stripper in at the same time of year, it was at three. That's the kind of magnitude you're looking at. And it doesn't matter how big a piece of water. I mean, you look at Connors and you think it's a hell of a piece of water. You know, if somebody goes to the toilet in that, it doesn't make an awful lot of difference. But it does when there's 5,000 people going to the toilet and there's 5,000 people all emptying the washing machines. And it's just a, a case of scale. And hopefully, hopefully we've caught it in the nick of time before it gets to the point like where Windermere got to where it was almost brought back from the brink and they're still not convinced it is and we've, we've, we've come across this other, these other sort of issues things like roach in the lake there's been roach caught in Coniston where the hell have they come from? Tench and there was, there was a tench earlier on this year a six pound tench and the only thing we can think is it's as a result of flooding from town house or it could be legacy from live bait with pike anglers, like it's reputed to be on Windermere. Although on Windermere, you've got whole herders of fishery in that catchment that holds coarse fish. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of influences that we can't really do an awful lot about. We can try and manage them. Water quality is one. Non-native species is another. But the climate, locally, we can't do a lot about. And so it's a case of we need to try and act and there's, there's good people doing good work, managing to try and go forward by maintaining the, the habitat and trying to keep water quality right, which will hopefully preserve things going forwards until whatever happens with the climate happens, really. And do you feel the nutrification, with its knock-on effect in being able to support more coarse fish species, might in turn increase pike population numbers, thereby increasing the predation threat also to the char? Or do pike and char tend not to overlap that much because of the distribution within the lake? They definitely mix, don't they? Oh, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've got char with bite marks on them. We've had char actually attacked when they've been on the gear, the jar takes the lure, you start bringing the, the gear in all of a sudden you get a big dead weight on it, and you either bring in half a jar, or the jar isn't there, it's just been ripped off the up, and that's definitely a pike, there's no doubt about that. And the, there was a pike caught down at the boating centre a few years ago, and it had a jar inside it, I think that was one pound, four or five, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, a really a big good jar. jar. Yeah. But you're losing char when you've got them on the gear and pike are actually taking the char off your gear that sort of tells me that them pike are following the shorts of char about that's what that's what my impression mm, yeah. is you know i mean the, the, the issue i have because a lot of the sort of pike buffs will turn around and say a pike population will be self-limiting because when they get to a certain point they start eating themselves well i think that's great when you've got a relatively confined gravel pit or a you know, Red Mire Pond or wherever it is. But when you've got a different dynamic like you've got on these glacial lakes where you've got 
a relatively shallow area, the littoral zone, where light penetrates, and, and that's the typical habitat of these fish and the coarse fish, the perch, the, the minnows, and all, all that kind of thing. That's their typical habitat. But when you've got an area where they can go and get another food source, that pressure that they feel in their relatively shallow water is very much diluted, in my opinion, because you know, the pike can say, well, actually, I don't really need to faff around and try and get a few perch for my tea, because there's easy pickings down below. And people catch pike at 40, 50, 60 feet. I mean, we get them on the bottom spinner, which mm-hmm. is fishing at 60, 65 feet. They are not going for perch, although that said, you do catch perch at that end sometimes. But typically, it's not the habitat of perch in 65 feet down. But you know, I'm conscious at the moment, some people are catching some absolutely belting perch. Two pounders, three pounders. Big perch. There's something happened in the lake. I mean, the weed growth is different now. This year, apart, and I'm hoping that this year, because it's the first full year we've had the phosphate stripper in, this year, anecdotally, the weed growth isn't as much. And the prevailing wind comes up the lake, so the phosphate, the heavier phosphate load would be at the north end of the lake, where the discharge is. I'm hoping that the, the sort of chemistry change that we're inducing is actually sending it back the other way. I mean, we used to be able to fish for trout with, with minnows up the north end of the lake into June, July, before the weed growth got to the point where you think it's not worth going because we're just going to catch a bunch of weed. But now it's April. Oh, historically it's been April. And, you know, you just haven't been able to really fish the north end of the lake in the way we would normally fish it with rapalas or or anything like that for trout because, A, the trout aren't necessarily there in the same numbers, but B, it's just physically impossible because of the weed. On the subject of trout, do you ever pick up any ferox trout in the course of your fishing? Occasionally, yeah, yeah. I I lost a trout about two months ago, maybe six or seven pounds. It, it actually straightened the uh, snappling carp behind the boat. I had it on for a minute or two, it was just behind the boat. Every time I got it near the boat, it would tear off again. Occasionally you get all the salmon. We've got a salmon on Windermere, that was just a grills, four pound grills. That was a few years ago now. I actually towed one around on Coniston mm. a few years ago. Took the top bait, took the rod under water, and I towed it around for an hour and 20 minutes. I kept getting it to the boat. It kept tearing off, so I put it back on the rod and I'd row around with it, foolishly thinking I was going to tire it out, and it's only swam about, <laughs> I don't know how many thousand miles to get here, and uh, eventually it snapped me. But it, that would be somewhere nudging 13 or 14 pounds, that. Every year you'll get all the one or two big fish. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Put a photo with me, the one we got on Lock Melvin. Yeah. That'd be about five pound, I think, yeah. five and a half pound perhaps. That took the second bait down and it jumped straight out of the water. Before any of us got hold of it. Yeah, before anybody had a chance that to look at the water. a two pound weight up with it when it yeah. came out of the water. So that was a powerful fish, wasn't it? That was really, I mean, it was a bit of a, a bit of a coup to even get it in the boat. It was, I mean, it's a relatively small ferrox, but that had some power. Mm. To, to drag that weight behind it and come out the water. Windermere tends to be the home of the bigger trout. They're caught on a regular mm. basis on there where they're not on the air. I've heard of one, there's definitely been one trout caught at five pound this year on Coniston and another one five and a half. I've seen a photograph of the five pound and it was a cracking, you know, mm. really nice cracking fish. Mm. But there's, there is some big trout in there. Just now and again you get hold of them. The fish that I got hold of about two months ago, I'd actually dropped the tackle down a bit in the vein hope of catching some char and it took the bottom bait and that would be fishing at about 75 foot. And that's how far down it was. But we fished on Loch Garry in, uh, in Venetia and we uh, we got uh, all of a really big trout on there, didn't we? And it, it, it came out of the water and it was about four bait mm. down. It came out of the water, it was, but it had snapped. It had snapped the snap link at that point, and it come out of the water, and you know you just saw this shadow come out of the water, and that was a bloody big fish. That was that could have actually been double figures. 
You're talking here of trout taking what to them must look like quite small meals. Do you not think that if you used to troll say a large dead bait or a rapala lure, you might have more ferox trout success? I don't know really, it takes a certain breed of person to target that sort of fish because you're going to have a lot of blank days aren't you? Mm. Whether I would have the patience to do that, I don't know whether you'd have the patience to do it Jeff, all the time. You know. It's the time more than the patience, yeah. I think. The other thing is, of course, we're not allowed to, you're not allowed to troll char dead baits now. You're not allowed to do anything with freshwater fish, which is a bit disappointing, really, because, you know, the, the, the minority have ruined it for the, for the majority. But it's entirely possible. I mean, we've, we've been with downriggers and all sorts, haven't we, and, and just mucked about, really. We've never really set ourselves up properly to do it we've caught big trout on film here yeah? mm. I had one four and a half five mm. yeah, that kind of weight and that was just on a, a rapala a deep fishing rapala but the fish are on Coniston they're definitely there but it's it's catching them I think the pike lads do quite well with them when they're mm. fishing dead baits mm. they definitely catch them and they'll they'll catch seven eight pounders and put them back which we quite like but you know, if they catch a seven or eight pound pike, then they can do what they want with it. <laughs> Last year, I recorded a podcast with Ron Greer of Ferox eighty five. Yeah, no Ron, yeah, yeah, I know Ron, yeah. And he was telling me that his worst ever record trolling for Ferox was thirteen consecutive blanks. Now that, to me, must be soul destroying. Yet when I fished with him, we had fish of fifteen and a half and twelve and a half. Plus, we dropped off another around six pounds all in the same day. I know, Ron, because he actually came and did a talk down at, uh, at Windermere, but I knew, I knew of him before, and we fished on Loch Rannoch, and we, did we catch a couple of trout, and that was it, I think. Yeah, we didn't catch any char, that's what we were targeting no. char, but we didn't catch any char at the time. The, you know, which, which almost adds to the mystery of it, but, and yet we fished on Loch Tay, and had some belting char off Tay, it was absolutely fantastic. We were fished on our keg for the big jar that you know they're in there, and the ones we were catching were probably like more like Windermere jar, you know, yeah, yeah. Three, quarters three quarters of a pound. Of a pound. Or so. But they all had, but they all had sort of distended bellies, like they'd been under the fish cages, but yeah. they just hadn't grown into being the big boys, you know. Yeah. Yeah. One, there was a Windermere chap there up there, well, two lads, yeah. and they were catching jar to about seven, eight pounds on on the gear, the traditional char gear. On our keg. On our keg, just yeah. landed on it right. They had into. Teens and mm. teens of jar. There's photographs of them on a, on a wall after, and they just look like big cob, don't they? Yeah. Really big fish. And yeah. said they, they lost one or two behind the boat that were over ten. They just couldn't hold them. It's all a bit artificial, really, though, in the sense that it takes man's intervention. In this case, salmon farm pellets to achieve those sorts of weights. It is. It is. Yeah. But it, in some, it, it's almost like a difference between going to to say Ull's water and catching a, a three quarter pound wild brownie and going to Diva Springs and catching a 23 pound one you know the same fish you know different history the fish were catching on Coniston now you know a pound fish when we were youngsters but a pound fish was a hell of a I fish I can remember getting one 15 ounces in, in the whole bay at Coniston Hall and it sticks in your mind, it was that yeah. so much bigger than every other child you'd ever had before that, you know, it's three, four ounce bigger than anything else. But now, it's just commonplace. If you get a char on Coniston, chances are it's going to be a pound or more, like, you know, at the moment anyway. The, the thing that strikes me about Coniston char, and I, it's not, I'm not saying it's out of any bias, but you, you look at a Coniston char, and you could put a Coniston char and a Windermere char and a Crummick char together. And the Coniston char will always look the prettier fish, the nicer fish, better proportioned. You know, it'll always be the, the belle of the ball. For me, it'll be the same. If you put three char together, a Crummock char, a Coniston char, a Windermere char, we could probably pick out the Coniston char and, and the Crummock char and the Coniston char. And yeah, if you, if you go to Buttermere, the Buttermere char and the Crummock water char, very similar. That's presumably because they were the same race and they were just landlocked because of, or separated because of, of, a, of a landslip or a, a reduction in uh, in water levels. But I mean, we've, we've been had char out of uh, Ennerdale uh, a number of years ago and they just look different. The, some of them look more like a Coniston char and some of them look almost like a, a herring to look at. And they, they were definitely char. They weren't skelly or anything. They were definitely char, but they've just got like the, the shape of a skelly. And you can even catch them on, you catch char on, uh, Thilmian. 
and they're similar they're, colour to Coniston yeah, though, they, they are, are the leaner the, the leaner and they're a bit they have a, a more fragile appearance mm. and unlike on Coniston you know if you if you catch a fish early doors and you're out all day by the end of the day the, the line of the gut is getting a bit discoloured but on the fish from Thirlmere within an hour or two you know they're, they're looking a bit you think <laughs> you should better gut that and it's just it's interesting how the different they're very very close in terms of geography but in terms of how they've evolved I mean look at Thirlmere Thirlmere used to be two lumps of water which one were they in? Because now you, you go to Thirlmere and it's 140 foot deep at the deepest point, but at the dam it's only 30 feet. So they've only, only really raised the level by about 30 feet. Buttermere is 90, 90 90, 94 yeah. feet at the deepest. So you think that's, there must be like a bit of a cut off. Because Dirt Water no longer has char, and that's, mm, I think it's about round about 100 foot at the deepest point. So there's a, there's a definite cut-off, and maybe with Buttermere being that little bit higher up, the the climate there is a, is a little bit more favourable for it. But they're very much on a knife edge, and, and it's got to have the depth and the, the elevation, and, and everything's got to be just right for them to carry on. I mean, people still say there's char and water. I don't think there is. No, the, the lead's killed them. I went when they were the lead mining. But... There's still supposed to be uh, skelly in there. I caught them. You caught them. But we've we've char fished on there, haven't we? And yeah. we 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 had the odd. I think if you fished it for a season, you'd find out whether there's char in there. But would you want to waste a season? <laughs> yeah. On all what I'm thinking, you might catch something. I might not. You might catch a shelly or something. Yeah. I don't know. You might do. I mentioned in my introduction that book I had listing around 140 UK char species. Now, of course, all sharing the same identification and same name. Are they then, in your opinion, all the same species, or is this a clear-cut example of evolution, or at least subspeciation taking place? Yeah, definitely they've just adapted to their own lakes. I mean, on Windermere, there was still, up until relatively recently, and nobody really knows if they died out, a race that used to come up the Brady and spawn in the Brady. You know, more typically like they, like they were traditionally done from the sea. You see that on Loch Garry, you see it in Loch Inch on the Spey, but as far as we know, we don't see it on Coniston. The only sort of, shall we say, nod towards that kind of thing is where we think there's a, there's a group that actually spawn off Tarverbeck, and that may or may not be sort of like habitual, but nobody's really, really sure. And... I think that the fact that we can tell different fish from different places is m- partly because we know what they look like from different places and partly because they have drifted away slightly. I mean, it's what, 10,000 years since the last ice age. A lot can happen in 10,000 years. The wind of me has probably changed chemically from all recognition from what it was 10,000 years ago. Coniston possibly the same, possibly Crummick and Buttermere less so Thilme is a different place Horswater is a different place because they've got the, the heavy draw down in the summer and they're all under so many different stimuli that it's very difficult to to say that they shouldn't have changed and why are they different but they've all just adapted to where they're at Actually quite a bit of what you do relates to certain aspects of the rod and line fishing I did Though obviously, my gear is very much lighter, uses a single lure, and doesn't have such a big weight to take it down. Have you ever tried proper rod and line fishing for them? Well, that's how we originally yeah, started. Yeah, that's how we Just trolling rather than yeah. just, you know, chucking off the bank. Well, saying that, I can remember when we were lads, we used to go around the east east side of the lake, uh, it'd probably be April time, and you could catch them off the side there. If you got a heavy lure and threw it off the side and let it sink... Counted to say 10, brought it in, we didn't get it, check it out again, let it sink to 20. And I've seen it, I didn't actually catch any, this is really pissed me off. <laughs> but, uh, I've seen them caught, round, you'll know where I'm at down below, you know, around the backside there. There's two places I've had them from the shore, one being on the Coniston village side towards the Allen Tarn end, where there's the lay by with a steep drop down below it, the other being off Brantwood. Both spawning areas. 
We also used to take them below the layer by in the boat very close in. So what's it like there these days? On the day, you can go in there and, and still catch fish. It's just different of days. And that's where I picked them up on the fly, using a lead core shooting head with a gaudy red and silver lure which we nicknamed the Char Lady. It would be nice to get them a lighter fly tackle fishing higher up in the water. I have heard that they do come up to the surface at times. Have either of you ever experienced this? I mean, not in recent times, but we have seen the char come up mm, in small it. shoals. Yeah. And you can you can tell because you can see when they're turning over, you can see the red on them. You know, they're definitely char, but not. You know, I have heard of shoals of char on Windermere coming up years ago, and big shoals. You know, not just one or two, but thousands of fish. Can't say there's ever seen that on Connison, but no, you see a group of like fifteen or twenty mm. fish dimpling, just just little ringlets on. Then they'll those. go down, yeah. and they'll come up somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you sort of roll towards them, think, oh, we'll have a bit of a cast at them, and then they're behind you. You know, they, they move about and they're, they're so easily spooked. But yeah, you do see them on the top. And in fact, we've even caught char with a spinner, literally within a couple of feet of the back the of the boat, boat. Yeah. and they've taken it literally next to the boat so they're, they're very much on the surface just as much as they are you know subsurface and down deep you've obviously put a lot of hours in trolling for char and on a number of different lakes what is it then that attracts you both so much about trolling as a technique and the char as a species for me it's uh, getting on the lake summer morning five o'clock nobody else on that water You've got it to yourself. It's peaceful. It doesn't really matter whether you're going to catch any. It's, it's nice to catch a fish or two, but it's not the be all and end all. That's what appeals to me. You don't know what you're going to see. I, I've seen an osprey getting mobbed by crows on the lake. I've seen kingfishers flying about. There's always something to see, something different. You see a fox trotting through a field with a raw deer barking its head off down the east side. Yeah, and, and there's also, I mean, like, you, you go out in October on a real sort of crisp morning when there's maybe been, like, one of the first frosts of the uh, of the autumn and you hear, well, you know, you go out and get out on the lake and there's maybe some uh, some folk have lit the fires and you can see the sort of stratification of the of the air, you know, the the smoke goes up so far and then it comes across in a straight line it, and, you know, then the sun just starts to crack over Grisdell and you think, it's not so bloody bad, is it? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's a really, 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 it's a lot worse places to be. And, you know, the colours, especially, I mean, I, I think autumn's my favourite time of year to be fishing because Down the fish, the back yeah, because the, the, the colours are fantastic. And the fish, when you get, you know, you like, you get a cock char or something and, you know, it's kite sort of, it's just got like a hint of a kite and, you know, you can tell a cock from a hen and, and just like, it, there's just something about it and it's like almost wilderness fishing you know you, you could be you could be in Maine or in Canada or somewhere like that you really could be a, a thousands of miles from where you're really at but it's on your doorstep it doesn't matter how many fish you've caught before how many char you've caught before when you get that char and you bring it in the first one in the morning you've always got to have a look at it there's just something stunning about conies and char the colours the proportions. I don't know. I never get bored no. of looking at them. I just like, really... I say, like I say, you know, they're almost the bell of the ball. I mean, you you, you compare. You know, you can get some good looking trout, and it doesn't mean I'm, I'm strange, but you get a, a trout and you think that's a good looking trout. That's a really fit looking fish. But you look at a char, a really good Coniston char. I mean, there's a photograph of one there, and you just think, what a fine looking fish. What a fantastic. And you can't even really capture those colours. If, if you were to try and paint those colours, you couldn't capture them because they're not silver, they're not grey, they're not bronze, they're not pink, they're not orange, they're, they're just their own colour. It's very, very difficult to kind of capture those colours if you were trying to paint it. And of course, the other, there's the other thing that guy usually fish with, Bill, and, and there's the crack side of things as well. You know, we maybe don't, we're sort of best of buddies, and we maybe don't see each other for sort of four or five weeks, and just catching up, and you know, there's there's never a dull moment because if you're not having a crack, you're uh, you're fishing properly, fishing, or you know you're taking the piss out of each other. Really, <laughs> <laughs> you paint a lovely picture of the lake and the fish, 
But what gets to me more than anything else is the fact that Coniston used to be a part of my home county, Lancashire. People who don't know much about life in the North West see Lancashire as flat caps, mill towns and cobble streets. And to think, we also had this beautiful char-inhabited lake. Well, Coniston Old Man was always the highest point in Lancashire. And sometimes you think we would still be better off in Lancashire if Lancashire was as it used to be and it included Manchester and Liverpool. And sometimes you think, you see the goings on in Manchester and Liverpool and you think, well, maybe not, but... And I was, what, seven when they, they changed it all. And it's it would be nice to be part of Lancashire sometimes, just from a, a, a sort of historic point of view. And Cumbria, what is, what is Cumbria? It's, it's like an amalgamation of... of, of things really and it doesn't really mean a lot because a lot of people still think that this is Lancashire um, it's it's a, it's not really it's not something we can influence but you know it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what they say what it says on your address you know you are where you are and Coniston is Coniston and uh, you know whether you've heard of it or not it just is where it is what I enjoy about fishing for char this time of year, if I go out in the morning and I'm the only boat fishing on Coniston mm. and I come off with a char, I will probably be the only person in England to catch a char because there's nowhere else that you're allowed to in fact, In fact, actually, you're probably the only place in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I'm going to lock up Scotland somewhere. Yeah, but, but, but equally, you know, it, it, people don't fish for him. I mean, we, we went up Loch Garry, we bust a fishing net on the first day there, bust a landing net, went into Inverness and said to the guy in the uh, in the fishing shop, can you recommend anywhere where I could go for chair? And he says, we don't cause fish around here. <laughs> you know, the, people haven't actually heard of him and they've got him on Not the doorstep. The doorstep huh? As a tradition, well and truly ingrained into the fabric of the Lake District, what do you think the future holds both for the technique of trolling and for char as a species itself? My opinion is it, it's, it's dying out. Mm. For a few reasons, really. A lot of chaps have given over because they're not catching the same amount of fish they used to catch. They've sold the boats, they've got rid of the gear, and they'll never get back into it again, and they'll never bring anybody else into that sport because they've given over doing it themselves. Unless it's just a cycle we're going through and we're going to hit the good times in like 10 years down the road and people will get interested in it again. I think it's, it's on the decline, there's no doubt about that. It's just the diehards really now that are going out on that lake. Yeah. There's an odd one or two. My next door neighbour's just got into it. He just bought a boat. He's what, early 30s, mid-30s? He's in 40s now. Is it? And, uh, me and him fished on the lake the other day. We put 10 hours in for one char, you know. Not everyone's prepared to do that. But like Jeff said, it's not just about catching fish. It's about having a natter, enjoying what your surroundings are. Mm. You know, it's not all about catching your fish. And unless, unless you go, it might not be just a char you catch. You might end up with a big trout or something like that, you know. So you've, you've got to be on the water to catch them. Yeah, I am, I am trying to sort of get my kids in, involved in it. We take them out occasionally, mm. um, a little lad, he's all seven, coming up eight, and the uh, daughter's coming up thirteen, and they, they both love to be out there fishing, but... It's just holding the interest yeah, now, isn't it, because yeah. you fish are few and far between. When I was younger, I'd take young kids out fishing, Um you probably need to pass a test now or something. To <laughs> you, know, well, you know, when things are different, though, then you could take anybody out fishing. And there was lots of fish to be caught, and it held their interest. And they'll probably still remember it now. Some of them have gone on to be good fishermen. They've taken up fly fishing, you know. Mm. Maybe not char fishermen. Good. But it's, it's got them into the sport, you know. He's got them into the sport of angling. And, but equally conversely, you know, there's, there's one chap who we know who we took out char fishing... And now he's retired, and he, he took it up and had a boat built, didn't he? Mm. And and you know he, he loves his time out there, and he'd always he'd fish for salmon, and he'd, he'd fish for trout, but with a fly. And then uh, we, we sort of showed him how to do it, and he'd had cancer. And when he retired from work, he's right, that's it. You know, I'm going to spend some time out on here. And so it's a, it's 
I think it's a mixed picture and a lot of it will depend on the fortunes of the char as much as the char fishermen. You know, as long as there's char there, then folk will probably fish for them. Maybe not quite how they did 15, 20 years ago in the numbers, but hopefully we can sort of keep it going a bit. It's, I suppose it's a bit like the blacksmith. 200 years ago, there's probably blacksmith on every corner, but now there isn't. And specifically, what about the char in Coniston? Will it survive, or is it limping now towards terminal decline? I think, it's in, I think it's on a bit of a slope at the moment. Some of it will depend on what happens climatically, really. Um, they are at the southern end of, of where they should be, or where they're able to be. Um, if things carry on as they are in terms of temperatures, you can see that the writing's on the wall. But, you know, these last few winters, and with the change in the Gulf Stream, that, you know, it's a bit of the elephant in the room, really, then, you know, that nobody's talking about, but it exists, maybe that can be the saving grace, because we've seen some really pretty, as we say, char-friendly winters over the last three or four years. And if they carry on, then maybe things will start changing. Although, you know, the, the uh, CEH will turn around and say, well, you know, they've got figures for the temperatures on Windermere and the average temperature is higher than it, even, you know, though, you know, for a few weeks of the year, last few years, it's been, uh, it's been frozen. Or well, parts of it have. But the average temperature is still higher. It's difficult, really. But you, you can see that, you know, longer term, 100 years, 200 years, maybe you'll see them go. But it would be nice to think that they could just kind of hang on a bit. Because you just don't know. I mean, this, this global warming, is it a cycle? How, how much influence are we having on it? Yeah, you can say we're pumping out a lot of CO2, but so did the, uh, the volcanoes. And also the Victorians. I think it's a bit of a, in the lap of the gods, really. Sad, really. After several thousand years, seemingly now going into decline. But it was climatic change in the form of melting glaciers that brought them here in the first place. And now perhaps it will be climatic change at the other end of the spectrum that could finally see them off. My thanks then to Jeff Carroll and Bill Gibson for giving us a glimpse into the world of a char fisherman and of course the world of the char itself. Ooh, the 